So, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you all, and thank you for joining us to create another marvelous day here in Ivan. Well, I am particularly beyond happy today for two reasons. First, that I can celebrate my baby's second birthday today with you. <laughs> no, don't be happy. It doesn't get any easier. We still have. <laughs> We still have those sleepless nights that we need to pause our sweet dreams and assist to the actual real nightmare which is happening <laughs> next door. And uh, yes, uh, we had to move to a new place because those looks in the faces of our neighbours were so expressive that they are experiencing like tough nights. So, <laughs> and they were quite kind to help us with packing and moving. They offered us to help them things. But I can, yeah, I can assure you that um, the former complex is now sleeping well and they are happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, today we are here to just wish that the third year this handsome boy would be more gentle with us. <laughs> but the second reason is the fact that finally we could start our illustration talks which was one of the main reasons we started a business around um, picture books. And um, let me start by giving you a story, one of my own memories of childhood. Years ago, when I was a little kid, it was one of those boring, boring afternoons in our harbour town. And my mom saw the restless look on me and suggested to take me to a bookshop probably to make it even more boring. But um, here we are on one of the busiest streets. And by the time we get there, it's nearly evening. And it's sunset. She drags me into an alley. And here it is a narrow dead end. Two black, pure black stone walls with ropes parallel. And books are hung over the rope, ropes exactly like wet clothes to dry. And the roof is a cloudless sky with shining stars. This is the first bookshop I go. And my mom takes me there every month. And each month I'm supposed to pick only one book, which is a torture. But <laughs> Those pictures on the covers, I am to tell you that my mom, the old bookseller, all the children I saw in the alley bookshop, they are all faraway stories now, but those pictures and those stories and those books, they stay wherever I go. Years later, I'm here in my new country, pregnant, desperate to find the books in my own language to read my, to my child and desperate to find that alley. But the alley is nowhere to be found. So we create it. A month later, as I'm here, a lady enters the shop with her two kids and the minute she's here, by then we are bilingual, Farsi and English books. The way she looks into the books and the way she browses, I know that look. I'm so familiar with those eyes. So she comes closer to me and with her voice, which is doom, asks if we have any, any books in Spanish for her children. And you can imagine the shame I had back then to say no. So a couple of weeks after that, we are that tiny alley with six different languages for children books. And we are even now still trying to expand to more languages because it is a demand on that. But I do believe that creation starts when everything else cracks and fades away. And the minute we created Ivan, several questions were haunting me, and they are still with me, and I'm struggling with them. Like, how does a bookshop fit and perform in a community? When you're dealing with children, 
how can you attract them to get beyond the distractions of language and enjoy a book? Do we have anything like standard book? And how we can step beyond any restrictions, any kind of boundaries, and then um, to communicate better with our own imagination through books? So these are the questions that stay with me. And before, I want to just let the, this uh, beast of curiosity loose and jump to the people in the panel. I would like Chloe to play a beautiful piece for us. Before that, I'm just going to give you a very short bio of Chloe, for those of us who are not well familiar with this brilliant young artist. Chloe Evans is an emerging freelance pianist and teacher in Brisbane with a vibrant personality and passion for creating music with and for people around them. As they approach the end of their degree at the Queensland Conservatorium, it is obvious her capabilities as a pianist have flourished, keeping busy with several solo performances this year, such as her second self-titled concert in May earlier this year. Chloe <coughs> is defining herself as a professional and enthusiastic accompanist for soloists of all levels. As they are most passionate about making music with other creatives, her animated approach to accompaniment successfully supports several young soloists through performances, exams, and they are excited to continue performing with professional soloists in future concerts and um, competitions, such as the Margaret Nixon's Prize. Please. Give it up for Chloe and yes, love. You can just perform whatever you like. <laughs> I was I was debating what to open the concert, uh, well, open the um, presentation with today, and I felt like I needed to start with a bang because everyone's like, you know, we've got to start it off. So this is a piece by List. It's not one of his very well-known ones. Um, and it is based on a poem in Hungarian um, about, um, it's kind of talking about how great Hungar Hungary is. So <laughs> this is a song about how great Hungary is. <laughs>
sorry if it's about Hungary because we're going to talk about Germany today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, she's got a piano fingers and talking of piano fingers, Caroline. Well, I'm more than happy just to welcome you here to join me, please, in the panel. Yes. Thank you. And we have the conductor Goss here, which is going to sit somewhere. <laughs> just let me make sure that he's stable. Lovely. So, Caroline, actually, your bio is one of those things that will never get old. Like, it is the true, vivid example of dynamic self. Like, every year you're just improving, whatever. <laughs> the art of illustration, yourself, us as readers and everything. For those of you who are not well familiar with Caroline, which I doubt, I would just give you a very short bio and then would start with you. So, Caroline Magel was born near Frankfurt in Germany and came to Australia when she was two. She lived on the yacht her family built until she was 14. In 2001, Caroline was awarded the Children's Book Council of Australia Cretchen Award for New Talent in Children's Book Illustration for her picture book, Grandma's Shoes, written by Libby Hotham and her latest award being the 2021 CBCA Honor Book for Picture Books as author and illustrator for NOP. That amazing book, that is so beautiful. She has been a May Gibbs Fellow and received an Australian Society of Authors Children's Picture Book grant to work on her book, Hazel and Rose. Nowadays, she's a full-time author, artist, illustrator and printmaker author and illustrator of many beautiful books such as Piano Fingers, which is her latest book published by uh, Walker Book Australia 2022 and Walker Books UK. And it is also translated to French and published in Canada by a French publication. So, um, well, Caroline was an award-winning and internationally distinguished illustrator, cartoonist and painter who is now recognized as a unique and arresting presence. Her work spans from dark, enigmatic oil paintings through incisive cartoons to lively children's book illustrations. It has been exhibited in a variety of galleries and art fairs and celebrated in numerous publications. So um, this is quoted by um, Chris Beatles the one who has uh, held the Magnificent Gallery in UK for you. So, Caroline, um, indeed, before we start, I have one very simple question. What is the formula of the magic you use for your picture books, <laughs> <laughs> please? <laughs> yeah. I keep it in a little bottle. <laughs> uh, so, I have thought about that a lot. Uh, it is... In, in the first instance, the inspiration that picture books have. So your story, mm -hmm. uh, I think we all have stories, something like that, where something happened that opened a door through which we scurried, and that something, oops, for me, was a picture book that my grandma sent me when I was very small. Uh, now, I have thought about and written a lot about the way picture books function, I analyse it, I talk to people about it, but you know what? Look at that. What do you feel? Do you want to look further? Does it engage you? Does mm -hmm. it intrigue you? Does it make you? Job done. 90% of the job is done right there because you want to know. That's it. That's the story. If you can keep that heart engagement with what you are doing as an illustrator or as a creator, job done. You are carrying on, paying forward, that beautiful spark that people who create picture books have always had, that's your job. And so what I do is I look at things that make me enthused and happy, which is a lot of things. Uh, I don't find it hard to be inspired. I, I write about things that I love. And um, sometimes that can be a problem because it is subjective, it's personal, and you can ask yourself, well, is anyone else going to be interested in a slug? 
It's my job to make you interested in the slug, and it can be done. It might be done. I might do it yet. But you know what I'm saying? It's, that's what we do, and if we can do that, we've, we've enlarged the world. We've, you know, we've given a gift. That's uh, our job. So I would say it's connection. Uh, to the world and giving that connection out through our art form with the help of beautiful people around us who support what we do. That's really important. Um, so when I write, uh, that's top, top of mind. And I have my processes, but yeah, that's what I do. Mm. Mm. Lovely. Mm. So Caroline, are you looking for anything in particular when you're trying to make a new work? I mean, do you, do you have something like a quest? For a special thing in picture books? I believe that uh, it is generally almost like a predetermined uh, row of books that I have to do because I have certain issues that I want to, I want to, it's, it's, it's where my emotional engagement is. So for example, Hazel and Rose was the first book I wrote, it took me 10 years to write, and it was about basically being a migrant and coming to a different country and what that feels like. And I know that I wasn't necessarily explicit around my experience in that book. It was very, uh, it, was, it went through a process where, you know, it could be read as a child um, wishing for a toy and the toy made a journey to, to her. But there was a lot of layers in there and it was, if you pay attention to it emotionally, you might understand it wasn't, they didn't say, hey, you know what, I came from a different country, it's a very difficult place, and when we got to Australia and it was kind of hard, and I didn't do that. I wanted to, I wanted to be metaphorical. So um, that was Hazel and Rose, and I had to write it, and I wrote it, and then I wanted to uh, write about a cat, because I have so many stories about cats, so I wrote the cat story, and then it was not, because my child had made this really ugly bear and it was really funny it was a part of our our relationship and the dynamics in our family the bear meant a lot mm. because of all the us three characters and it kind of it, yeah it, it 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 was about something important and so was piano fingers so it's almost like ah now i know what i need to do next and i that's the one mm. i have to do so Beautiful. Mm. Well, when I look at your illustrations, and we are blessed to have some beautiful examples here, and uh, parentheses, people are going to buy them. I don't know if you would like to sell them today, <laughs> but they are asking if, you, if they are for sale. Um, no. Well, when I look at those illustrations, they are really brave, like what we have in the world of picture books for children. They try to make it like um, big circle of faces, big eyes, things which are really clear. And these look like dreams, like as if you are sleeping and this is a dream happening. So this kind of illustration is really brave. Have you got any feedback like you need to try to <laughs> modify it or moderate Let it? Let them or? try. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather work in Woolworths than change. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm serious. That's where I'm at. Uh, yeah, it, it means a lot to me to... to express exactly what it is that I mm. I want to express, not because I'm so hard-headed, but because it's truthful. And it's my subjective experience. That's what I got from the books that, that uh, my grandmother sent me. It was a subjective view of the world that an illustrator gave. Mm. Okay, from communist bloc East Germany all the way to Australia, how would I relate to that? But I did because it was a, a landscape and a relationship that was honest and and heartfelt, and I felt it then. I thought, you know what? An illustrator can actually build a world in a book, on paper, with pencils. And even though I knew I couldn't do anything like as good a job, I knew someone had done that with pencil and paper. And I thought, that's fantastic. I want that. That's what I want. And yeah, that's, um, you have to draw a line somewhere and decide what, what you believe in and what you think is worth doing, and that's what I think is worth doing, that's why. Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go, fighting talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just going to try to soothe everything and ask you. No. <laughs> what is the reflection of children on your works? Like when, when you work with children and they see your work apart, well, how do they reflect on that? Is it too difficult for them to comprehend? or? Mm. I... I have sat with many children and drawn with them. 
Uh, one in particular, I remember I was drawing something and uh, she began to draw on her piece of paper over here and then she began to slowly draw toward my piece of paper. <laughs> and then she began to actually overcome my drawing and the teacher was like, well, whatever her name was, uh, you know, you need to stay over your side. No, 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 no. The thing is, children um, have their own vision and they frequently don't care about uh, other, what other people are putting forward and that's a, that's a good thing. They will take what they want from, from work. They will like it, not like it. That's okay too. I think as long as you, uh, you give something truthfully and with, you know, with, with passion, you, you stand a chance to communicate to children. And yeah, the, so far, so good. I think it's the adults who, mm. who ask questions, who, who go, well, you know what, mm. if the piano's too big or that. No child ever asks me that. No child ever, ever does that. And it's not because they don't think of these things, it's that they get it. You know, you can tell when a child, when they're drawing, when they suddenly discover eyebrows and eyebrows appear on faces and then fingers and things happen. Were they unhappy with their drawings before that? No, they weren't. They were very happy with their drawings before that. You know, it's, uh, it's a relationship with, with the world and I think they understand that. Yeah, beautiful. And I know the beautiful story behind um, Piano Fingers, your source of inspiration. Mm. Would you like to also share that? Yes. Uh, so uh, our daughter played from around the age of uh, five. She was interested in music all along. She still is really passionate about music. We got this old piano and uh, it, it had a personality immediately. It smelt of camphor and, and mice. It had been in a, a warehouse for quite some time. Okay. And on the foreboard, there were three scratches. So presumably there had once been a cat that had lived on top of the piano and it had scratched the piano. So through all the years that uh, our daughter was playing, she got to the level of almost conservatorium, nearly, nearly into the world of music. And then she swerved off into science. science. Anyway, um, the piano was... Uh, a, a big feature of our lives, the music and the mm -hmm. teachers and the, all the other children and the whole process. And through all that time, I began to come up with an idea. And Gus really emerged out of the piano, almost like a ghost, because every time she played, somehow the scratches mm -hmm. on that piano, I, I began to imagine a cat. And the, this cat was almost like an alter ego to, to our daughter. Um, mm -hmm. He was pompous, confident. This cat all the rest of it, yeah. and uh, I think that the dynamics and the tensions around learning music and all our little family issues kind of became a little play, and that's really how Piano Fingers evolved, and very much in pictures at first. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. I know that you have constantly, you have like tours around the UK, and then um, my question can be a bit challenging, but then I would like to dare and ask it. How do you compare um, what is happening here in the art of illustration and picture books in Australia with what is happening in Europe or UK, like based on your own experience? Where do you think Australia is standing, is standing here? I think um, Australia uh, punches above its weight in mm -hmm. terms of creative ability and talent. It's a, I think it's a growing industry. I also think that, yes, you know, there, 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 is, uh, there are changes, there are, there are pressures, there is, uh, it, it seems to have to carry a lot of weight these days um, around some of the issues that we all have to deal with and, with our, and talk to with our children. Publishing is taking some of that up and that's a good thing. I like the fact that there is uh, a lot of variety and it's a growing variety. Australia, um, I, from what I gather, around 50% of books sold in entirety are children's books, books for children. That's something to be really proud of. Um, it, yeah, I think it's, Australia's actually pretty good and I'm, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. As far as other countries, um, what I do notice is that there is, um, I think people have their own, you know, mindset and uh, I've heard it said that the UK doesn't import enough books from other places into it. I mean, a professor of literature said that to me. She wishes there were more 
picture, mm. book, picture books from other countries into the UK. Not the case. Don't know why. It is what it is. Uh, America has its uh, very much its own flavour, and 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 you know it's got its own issues to deal with. Each country does have its own agendas and its own people to serve, and that's you're going to have to you have to take it case by case. So it's hard to actually compare. I think mm -hmm. every place mm -hmm. is different, mm -hmm. and as you would know, you are a bookshop here in the valley. You have a community to serve. You can, mm -hmm. you know, take take that out. Each country has its problems and issues. Yes, and true. the book industry serves that beautiful. So, um, this is the question that I really like to ask as a bookseller. Well, um, we know that we are like a chain, and there are several rings attached to one another to serve, to create and um, kind of raise better red generation. Yes. Yeah. So, as a bookseller, I do always have this question in mind that uh, how can we serve better to people who are like creators of books in order to contain diversity in the books that we stock for children? Like, we need to bring a diversity, like change, and then to try to stock books which um, talk about different people, different races, different ethnic groups and things like that. So do you have any suggestions for bookshops and booksellers? As a yeah, sure, do something like this. Uh, reach out. Thank you, that was what I was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't have any hat, but... Uh, I know what to say. Uh, I think that this is the right thing. I, I have been super glad to see uh, a growing culture around people like us reaching mm -hmm. out because we have to, you know, we can't just sit at home. And uh, so that's what I believe part of my job is. And it, it horrifies me how much I actually have to talk now uh, because I'm, I'm actually quite shy. <laughs> <laughs> but I... I I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, if you believe in something, you'll find the strength to promote it, talk about it, and reach out to people, mm -hmm. and that's what I think my job is now. It's changed since I became an author. When I was an illustrator, I was much quieter. Now I think, you know what, I've got something worth talking about, and I find that there are lots of people who want to do this, and I'm connecting up with them, mm -hmm. and we are pushing towards something really, really cool. So yes, yeah. and it's, it's going to be down to us. We have the passion and the knowledge, so it's going to be us who will take the message out and build, build bridges for people. That's what I think. Beautiful. Like, mm. you smell like home. Like, any time I see you, I feel more, more and more comfortable chatting oh. with you. Caroline, is there anything that you would like me to ask you and then you think that I've missed it? Oh, well, uh, I, I would mention that uh, I'm having a, an illustration show yeah, in October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. if you want to see, like, the entire an entire wall of how I built piano fingers, mm. words, pictures, the whole thing. I've got all that and I will put it up on the wall and you can check it out. It's fun, you know, how, how a book is made, at least how I make them. Um, and they'll be up for sale and there'll be events and it, it will be quite cool. So that's coming up in October. I'll post oh, yeah. some things Where? in Toowoomba. Yeah, that's so it's, um, but that's, you know, miles away. It's October, but um, I will put some stuff up about it. it. The whole point is to, I, I'm hoping that it will show people what goes into books. Um, and that in itself is a way to understand books better and understand why it's so good to read to your kids because there's so much in them that people put so much effort in. It's, um, it's what I'm hoping to achieve in October or begin to achieve. So, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. People... Do you have any questions from Caroline or anything about her books? I think we've covered <laughs> Beautiful. So I know these chairs are not so comfortable. So if you do agree with me, uh, we will have a pause here. And uh, we have a very... Yes? Quick question. Yeah. Are any of your books translated into other languages? Yes, into French. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, no, at the moment, yeah, it's French, yeah. Sorry. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> like, we couldn't have you. <laughs> have you had a meeting before? <laughs> like, was it planned? <laughs> oh, so beautiful. Any other, like, 
Lovely. Uh, we would have a very short break, so if you would like to try any of those sweets back there or our exquisite coffee, you are more than welcome. And we would start a panel again with um, Dr. Lara Ken Gray and Enda. At the moment, it, yeah, have a look at the Ash exhibition. And Chloe is going to play more music, so yeah, thank you. We'll meet back again shortly. Thank, thank you. you. I would like to start the second half of the panel introducing our lovely, brilliant young artist who's been running the workshop in the other room all this morning with your beautiful kids. So this is Mattis Kia or Mattis Smith. And um, because my memory is very poor, and this is due to after a pregnancy kind of thing, <laughs> I'm going to just read her beautiful bio to you, a very short part of it. Mahdi Smith, um, full-time PhD candidate and part-time artist and business development manager, is passionate about cultivating creativity, equality, and diversity seeds in the beautiful mind of future. Stories of five little wardens were inspired while colouring and drawing images with her two-year-old niece. Luckily, she doesn't have a child yet. <laughs> she couldn't create any of that. <laughs> her four books are over there, so if you would like to have a look, you're more than welcome. Don't forget to get her signature in case you would like to picture, picture, uh, purchase them. Each of seahorses represent an element of nature like fire, metal, wood, water. And you have detailed ones in the stories themselves. These lyrical short nursery rhymes are designed to create confidence and sense of fulfillment in children. So uh, please give it up to Matthew. for helping us. And um, do, if you have any queries about um, the books, you can find Matthew in her workshop room in the end of the corridor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Right. Um, we are more than blessed today to have a press person here who has devoted her life to children books, researching on them, and to find the essence and true nature of these beautiful magics that we have around us. Dr. Laura Kent Gray. Thank you very much. Right. You're, you're definitely introducing me at everything I yes, ever do. Yes, I am, I am. Table. Please, please, just let me do that. It, it would take a couple of seconds. She is uh, the specialist librarian at non-profit non education uh, publisher library. A library for us, sorry. She's also a picture book researcher specializing in translation, visual literacy and reading cultures. She reviews children's books on her blog, Charming Language. Her own book, A Grown-Up's Guide to Picture Books, will be released in 2023. So shortly we will have a, another panel with Thank you. you. I was ask you that. <laughs> I'm mesmerized by the title you've used for your blog, like Charming Language. This is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. How did you come up with this? title and how did this title help you to have a better communication with your audience like yeah. well um, the origins of it actually are probably less poetic than what you might know <laughs> um, that, that I, yeah, my blog started being very much focused on um, children and on parenting mm. and my experience with parenting as a lot of people do when they start a blog um, and it was called This Charming Mum at that point which was actually a play on the Smith song This Charming Man for anybody who's <laughs> closer to my age group so that, that was sort of you know the, uh, the origins at that time but as um, it evolved and I realised that what I really wanted to focus on was children's books um, and moving away from that parenting space a little bit um, and bringing together my experience as a parent and as someone increasingly passionate about children's books combining that with my PhD um, topic at the time, which was around uh, cross-cultural communication and translation. Um, so when I realised that that was what I actually wanted to continue dedicating my research time to, I switched it to the to charming language, mm -hmm. um, which is a little a play as well. You know, in English sometimes we say, "Oh, that's charming language," when we mean actually something that's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I think that. 
um, charm is what I see in in the mechanics of language. Um, and now that I am researching picture books in a range of different languages, I'm often asked, you know, how many languages do you speak if you're able to, to look at this research across all of these? And in truth, I, I barely probably speak English that well some days, but, and I have a little bit of French. But what I'm fascinated in is the way that, you know, words and pictures can interplay, even if you can't actually understand all of the words, that there are all these other languages that happen in picture books, the language, the visual literacy, obviously, but the language of the layout, the way that the spines sit, the end papers, they're all languages, they're all um, a way of communicating and storytelling. Um, so that's probably the long answer to your question is that, you know, yeah, I find yeah, all I those that, elements yeah, of language yeah. and story charming. Beautiful. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, would you like to start with the um, kind of research that you had on the picture books? And then I will start bombarding you with my questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, look, you know, uh, I'm sure this is a room full of people who are already passionate about um, picture books, so there might not be too much new that I can teach some of you. Um, but yeah, I'm a specialist librarian, so I work um, for a non-profit publisher um, who uh, curates and creates material to deliver into communities where they don't have a lot of libraries, so Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, Regional Australia, those sorts of places. So we work across a broad range of languages and cultures, um, so I've had regular exposure to that kind of idea of um, you know, how to make books work in different places through mm that side of things. Um, but what I've also been exposed to is people saying, well, we should be able to fast track this. We should be able to get more books out. They're just kids' books. It's not rocket science. <laughs> How hard can it be? You know, they're short. It should be easy to translate a children's book. It's only got 200 words. And I do have to constantly be that voice in the room going, hmm, well, <laughs> let me think, think so. about that. <laughs> Actually, it's an awful lot harder to get um, to distill amazing ideas into a short word limit than what it is sometimes to write a whole essay. Um, and again, you know, these, this visual literacy side of things is different in different communities and that sort of thing as well. So, um, so having had that experience, and again with my own academic background, I was really driven to create, I guess there are two research projects that have come out of it. So the first one, as you mentioned, is the Grown Up's Guide to Picture Books. So that one is um, to be published yeah, it's just gone to illustration stage, so about a year away, I suppose. Um, so hopefully, yes, well, I can have another event and I yeah. can <laughs> bore you all more with that, the information that's in that one when it comes out. Um, but what that one looks at is um, trying to re-engage grown-ups with the passion, like you spoke about, the reasons why they loved picture books when they were children. Because I think that we often do a real disservice to picture books once we're grown-ups by assuming that they're only there to serve as sort of literacy tools for pre-readers um, or to be a part of, you know, to be part of our literacy toolkit for kids, which of course is something that they do and should do. And the words of a picture book are beautiful and it's an art form in of itself. Um, but as mentioned, you know, there are all these other kinds of pieces um, that if you're not a teacher or a librarian or someone who's already in the arts, you don't necessarily understand that there are all those other kinds of language mm -hmm. going on. So my book's actually an A to Z. Um, so A, for example, is for animals. So uh, animals are in picture books because they're cute and funny and all those kinds of things. But there's also a whole range of psychological and educational mm -hmm. reasons why we might use an animal rather than a human character in a picture book. Um, I often use the example of the three little pigs, which, uh, you know, if, if I'm sure everybody knows that story, but, um, you know, it's a sort of quirky, rhyming little um, story about blowing down houses, which is fine with pigs, but if that story was told with little boys and girls, it'd be sort of mm. a, a hideous treatise on homelessness <laughs> and you know, disaster kind of thing. You know? So we use animals very strategically in children's stories to put a little bit of emotional distance sometimes um, between, you know, to, to talk about difficult subjects, I suppose. Um, and using animals can also strip out things like, um, like gender and cultural identity to make characters more relatable, all those sorts of things. So that's the kinds of things that I look at in my book, you know, the A for animals and helping parents re-engage with why they loved it and then also be able to take that then into that kind of dialogic reading space with kids. Um, so for, I, can, I want to use Caroline's book to show some of these things off as well. <laughs> um, Piano Fingers is beautiful. If you haven't read it yet, you must, and as you can see the evidence there. But um, my book has a, so E in my book, my A to Z, is E for end papers. So this is something that I think is 
really a misunderstood part of picture books uh, for mm. a lot of parents. Um, they serve, for those of you who are not already aware, a very practical purpose of literally just holding the pages to the hard covers. Um, that's where the glue needs to go. Um, but because of that functionality, it, it gives us this canvas space, which is often sort of like the opening and closing credits of a book, if you like. And the end papers can establish a mood for the story. Sometimes they have their own story that weaves mm. through them. Caroline's book here um, has different uh, representations of the lead character B at the front from the back. Um, so there's a little story that's mm. going on there yeah. as well. But when we read to children for literacy purposes, I, I see it all the time. People just skip straight past that, mm. straight to the words, because the words are what yeah. matter, because what we're doing is we're teaching kids to read. And we're not actually looking at all the other pieces mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I have a section in my book as well about white space. W is for white space. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was born out of talking to illustrators, um, working with illustrators uh, at, at Library for All. And someone saying to me, oh, surely it must be a lot cheaper and easier for illustrators to do pages like this, mm -hmm. where, you know, there's a whole lot of nothing in the background and there's just, you know, these sort of few feature pictures, that must be a good cost-saving device. <laughs> um, so I've dedicated a whole section of my book to talking about why the white matters absolutely on the page, because it draws focus yeah. and it helps, um, it, it uh, regulates the cadence of the language. Um, in this case in particular because it's about music, um, it's on this page I think, well, <laughs> obviously I have the expert here, but my interpretation is that it, it acts like a bit of a spotlight on me yeah. here. So that white or that negative space is definitely not just blank, it's absolutely part of the story. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's the first sort of research passion project mm -hmm. I have, I suppose, is to help just kind of to upskill mm -hmm. readers who might not have, you know, had done their PhD in mm -hmm. <laughs> picture books, but might be really, really keen to engage um, mm -hmm. on that level with with kids in their homes or schools or yeah. anywhere else. So, yeah. um, just to have a short pause here and a of question. Um, I was just wondering that um, is there po a, any possibility to define a standard picture book? Like when we want to choose a book for our little one to read to, is there anything like standard book or do you think all sorts of picture books are qualified good books to give to our little ones to read just because they are illustrated? Um, I guess in, in a pure publishing production sense, you know, there's a, there's a 32 pages, 200 to 500 words kind of format, you know, that, that counts as a standard picture book. But do you mean is there a gold standard or a... Yeah, a, like as, as parents, as people who would like to give something to our younger ones to start with, do we need to have some factors in mind to check them first and then go and get a book or is it just what what is fashion and brand these days in like every bookshop and then that's what I'm going to get for my time. Yeah, well I mean obviously what you see in bookshops is definitely led by marketing trends. Mm -hmm. um, Z, Z is for zeitgeist in my book, we'll <laughs> teach you more about that. Um, but absolutely that's the case for picture books. But I think um, I, there's probably two sides to that. One I would say that we should always let children explore mm a library or a bookshop and choose what interests them and it might be very different from what interests the parents or carers because adults are always invested in literacy and moral lessons, you know, the main reasons why those sort of gatekeepers choose books. Um, whereas sometimes children just want something silly or something fun or they see something very different in the book from what we see. So I think that's one response I would have to that is, you know, let children explore, let them choose a book that's in a language that they don't speak, let them choose something that would be completely different from your taste or what you read when you were a child and let them explore that. Um, but if it was an adult choosing a book for somebody, I would say just to be looking for something that has layers. That's what I think is always the best kind of picture book. So a, there are beautiful words, but there's also a story that's happening in the picture. and. Apart from the fact that that's interesting as a creative art form, I, I also think that visual literacy is a skill that is, uh, you know, a life skill that it's never too early to learn. And as we become increasingly visual in the way we look at things like news and advertising and political campaigns and so on, for children to be able to read around the words mm -hmm. about what's going on in the background, I actually think is essential. Amazing. Thank mm. you. So about this one, like uh, the word, yeah, I think I would like to see inside. Yes, this is, well, this is one of my favourites. Um, 
don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, I know. Nice. <laughs> We've got a fan. <laughs> Uh, this, so Carson Ellis is an American um, artist and author. Yeah. Um, she d- has done some other pretty cool things too, like album covers and lots of other things that I really like. But what um, what makes this one of my favourite books? Okay, a few things. You'll have to you'll have to just give me a time or something for how many things I could say about why I love this book. But for starters, um, the language in this book is made up. So it's it's a bug language. She would call it. But it's pronounceable and recognisable and consistent, so it it has its own consistent grammar, but it's pretend. So as you make your way through this book, um, so, well, you you can even see, what do you think the front cover says? What does anybody like to say? So What's that? There's two you little bugs you, looking at that? something. Yeah, do is tuck. You, you are something. Are you what, is, what, yeah. what is that? What is that? Probably something like that. So there you go. You've learnt three words in bug language in the last <laughs> two minutes without even trying. And that's what is the joy of yeah. this book. And what I think it exposes is that you could equally do the same thing with any mm. book in here um, and perhaps learn the language or perhaps just come up with your own narrative. Um, and the same goes for wordless books. Um, as you know, there are plenty of those around too that would do would serve the same purpose. The white space in here, again, serves to um, sort of showcase the scale. It makes the insects, if you can see from the back, makes the insects really small, um, gives them, uh, gives p- um, potential, I think, a sense of potential because there's a small little uh, plant here that's growing. Um, and over the course of the book, um, the plant grows, progressively fills that space um, with other things. So um, it's a really great demonstration of, um, of why that's absolutely not blank. It's part of the story. But I think most importantly for me, as before I came to this being a, a language nerd, I just love the fact that you can read this whole story. Yeah. You know, do is tak manazut. So I'm guessing, what's that? I don't know. Something along those lines. Um, when you move through a little bit, there's they're looking for something to figure out how to um, you know scale this plant. They find uh, their friend Icky here, <coughs> um, who lives in the log. Mm-hmm. Um, they say Icky and Baden and Ribble. So <laughs> it's nothing, but <coughs> when we look at the next page. We see Icky's brought something out of the log here, mm. and someone over here has gone, a gribble! So <laughs> we, we guess that's probably the word for ladder, you know, and we can yeah. interpret the story that way, again, without having to understand mm. the language. And I think that it's just the most beautiful demonstration of, of you know, all the things we've talked about, visual storytelling, mm. and the fact that a book has so many other languages going on in it, outside of mm. those words that as parents we just focus on so much sometimes mm. for literacy purposes. So, yeah. <laughs> and I can definitely imagine children reading these and then trying to make their own languages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. someone once said to me, you know, oh, but, what, but how do you know what it's meant to say? Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> there could be 50 different stories in here and that's absolutely fine as well so why do you care <laughs> that is lovely perfect mm. example yeah <coughs> excuse me <laughs> i've said that you've got more anything that you would like to well i just brought along a couple of others mm. because mm. i just um as i mentioned this is the other research project that i'm now working on now that the first book mm. is kind of in production my second major project is around translation of australian picture books into mm. other languages um, so I've had the privilege of interviewing a few authors and illustrators, um, publishers and rights agents and translators, mm-hmm. um, because there's a, there was a study done about a year ago in Australia um, around the economics of picture book publishing that said that about 21% of Australia's international rights sales was made up of picture books. So it's a really big yeah. sort of economic and cultural export for Australia. Um, and we, we get really excited about that, as, as we well should, but something we don't often think about is how much changes about the book when it moves into other markets. We would always expect the language to change, of course, but again, all those other things, sometimes books are re-illustrated, sometimes the layout changes, sometimes some other element of it changes. And I find that quite fascinating for what it says about our culture and about the market that the book is going into. If um, if a book has to be fully re-illustrated mm. to find a home in another space, that says something about their whole kind of repertoire of visual 
um, literacy, you know, the whole, um, all the norms, the marketing norms and visual norms in that space, and I find that really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I've been collecting a few, um, so obviously that's Philip Bunting's um, Me, Microbes and I, the Portuguese mm -hmm. <laughs> edition, some of you be familiar with some of these. Uh, Pig the Pug there in French. Carlos Le Bouton, <laughs> and Pig the Pug's done very well in lots of different countries. Um, the Bad Guys, that's the Norwegian edition of The Bad Guys. <laughs> that's going everywhere at the moment. Um, and of course, as, as was a very timely moment that Jenny asked a question about Piano Fingers, I have the French-Canadian edition of Piano Fingers. Um, because this is a case study that I'm working on. So I've interviewed um, Christiane de Chesne, who translated mm -hmm. this for Caroline, mm -hmm. um, who fortunately for me, not for her, said that it was one of the hardest translation tasks she'd mm -hmm. ever had to do because of the poetry mm -hmm. and the made-up mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. and the musicality of the language, which makes it a brilliant case study for me to, mm -hmm. to get nerdy about <laughs> um, for academic purposes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wow, I need to just get back to what I was. Sorry, yeah, sorry. No, that was. I'm a bit passionate, and I like that to talk really a lot about this. Thank you, um, Laura. Do you think that uh, picture books are designed and made for a particular audience, or do they contain a variety of people? Like, are they only for children? This is my question. Yeah. Because I'm addicted to children. Yeah. <laughs> Picture books and yeah. that. Yeah. And anyway. Well, when I talk about it, I always sort of say, forget the kids, this has got nothing to do with the kids. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. obviously, you know, that's the market and, you know, that's that's part of the appeal. And they are that kind of wonderful thing that can help children learn to mm. read and learn to love reading. But no, I actually, I really do think that that's one of, I think that's a really unfortunate thing that we do, that we say, you know, well, my, my child can read picture, can read chapter books now, so no more picture books, thanks. We're moving on to the real stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's something that I really rail mm. against for the reasons that I've said, um, because I think that our, our, the richer relationship you can have with visual literacy, um, mm. the more that that can benefit you in other parts of your life. Mm. And I don't think that that um, should be limited to children, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, one thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, you know, in pure commercial terms, of course, mm. um, you know, books are for kids, but the kids don't pay for them. So <laughs> they're, they're marketed yeah. to the gatekeepers in that mm. sense as well. Mm. But the gatekeepers don't necessarily look at them or explore them the same way that children do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing and I think Amazing. that... Um, yeah. Because what I have in my like, I'm when I'm working here, I see many people coming in and then they say, is this only for children? And I'm in, yes, but you can come in <laughs> yes. and enjoy them. And like, I feel really offended, like, what? I do enjoy this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Don't you like it? Yes. And um, the, other, the other thing is like, well, I know that you just said that it is really challenging to translate these picture books to other languages, but we think it's not. And um, what I have in mind is that these pictures, they they are really helpful in the in the case that they are they are trying to take the story parallel as they as we have the text, so we have the pictures. And um, I'm just imagining that if a child does not know in that, that the language itself, and the book is not translated to that language, these books can still help the child create the story. And this is what, what really amuses me about picture books, the ability that they have to communicate with various types of people. And um, what, what I have in mind is like, um, when we're talking about translation, what are the factors that a person, a, a translator, needs to have in mind when translating to a new language? Well, what is the difference between picture books when you are translating them with like something like a fiction or a novel or a short story? Mm. Yeah, what makes it challenging? Yeah, um, I think the challenge is the brevity. So mm -hmm. um, with uh, a novel, um, you've got a little bit more space, just literal space, numbers of words to to um, you know create an illusion or reproduce something or or what you might call intratextually translate. So if there's a cultural, a specific cultural thing that's represented in a book that doesn't translate mm. in a novel, you can take three or four sentences to kind of give the reader a context mm. or give them an understanding of what that might be. Mm. In a picture book, you've still only got your, you know, your 20, 30 words a yeah. page and you've got to make that work in a different way. Yeah. And then you add into that things like, um, you know, alphabet books, which mm. obviously the alphabet mm. is not mm. the same in every mm. language, like rhyming, which doesn't work. Um, in other languages, so the 
uh, translator is under pressure to capture the essence of the story mm. and either make it rhyme in their own language or mm. you know carry it over in some other way so it's still sort of lyrical but not rhyming mm. um, in their language. Um, and then unusual things that are just sensibilities. Um, I don't know if this is a bit much, but <laughs> in, I just what, just a strange little thing. So if you look at the two versions of piano fingers, you, like you can see uh, I just a common device in storybook in picture book writing is to leave a little bit of suspense in the writing. So um, you know Isla had a honey fog machine, but B had dot dot dot. Piano fingers, you know, so that kind of reveal. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, in the French edition, that hasn't been done. Mm -hmm. So, and that's an assumption around what the norms would be for the readers in that mm -hmm. language. So they've chosen to do the piano fingers here and then to put the focus on the next part of the story on the mm -hmm. next page. So there are all these mm -hmm. curious little things that people only know when they're operating from within a language, mm -hmm. what the expectations of the reader would yeah. be in that sense. So for us to look at two texts and just say, well, we're just flipping this word into that word, that's just never how it works. That, that was an amazing, <laughs> a brilliant example because even in our own language like Persian, the verb comes in the end of the sentence. Yes. So when you want to split this in two different pages, that wouldn't be that kind of vibrant and beautiful because then you're expecting the noun, but the noun is yeah. like you know already revealed. Yeah. Beautiful. That was yeah. an amazing one. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, one final question that yeah. I have, because you have done a great research on this topic, where do you think the future of Australia is leading in the case of picture books? Like, where where, where do you see Australia going? Like you have the background and everything and then uh, what do you think is the future that we have for Australia in the criteria of picture illustrations? Yeah it certainly seems to be you know a vibrant and growing mm -hmm. space in terms of um, the groundswell of creative activity and intellectual engagement with the creative activity. Mm -hmm. I think one of the I don't know if it, limitation's not the right word, but ultimately, of course, publishing's a business, so um, the most exciting creative pieces don't always become the best sellers, and that's true, I guess, across you know all different genres, but I do see that in picture books. Um, one thing I think that's interesting about this particular space is that um, obviously international rights sales and international sale of your book is important, you know, financially for authors, you know, who, who don't ever get paid and illustrators who don't get paid as much as they should generally of course um, but um, occasionally then you'll hear people say well I'm going to write with an international audience in mind or mm -hmm. illustrate mm -hmm. something that is more universal and I do worry a little bit that the more that we do that the less mm -hmm. you kind of lose mm -hmm. um, sort of an authentic mm -hmm. voice mm -hmm. and then you can open up lots of different questions then about um, you know own voice representation and you know different sort of cultural and diverse representations and what that means then um, for those voices when they are you know, moving into the international space. So I think there's some real pros and cons about the globalisation um, and the mobility of Australian picture books in the international space, but I do think it's exciting and positive, definitely. Definitely, it is. It is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. That was really brilliant. Well, that's okay. And, uh, do, do you have anything that you would like to add? Anything that you think I've missed? From... No, I think we've probably we covered all the territory. And, yeah, so I feel questions? like a fraud since I don't have my own book to hold up and show up yet. <laughs> We'll get there. <laughs> That's beautiful. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, love. And <laughs> <laughs> um, how hard was it you to for you to find those books in other languages, and mm -hmm. did you so go specifically looking for? Um, specific titles. Yeah, well, in some cases, obviously, you know, I'd, I'd spoken to Caroline and I was able to speak to yeah. the illustrator, so, uh, the translator, so I sort that one out. Um, then I went down to Canberra on a research trip to the to National, National Centre for Australian Center Children's, Children's Literature. Literature. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and they've got multiple editions of mm -hmm. most Australian books um, that have mm -hmm. been translated, or in some cases, 23, 24. Um, but they also have very limited space. So I feel like this was the universe speaking to me. And I went down there um, and out the, in a trolley out the front, they had the second edition, the second copies that they didn't have space to shelf oh. <laughs> for all of these different books for two dollars each sitting out the front, <laughs> which would have cost me about, it would have cost me hundreds or in fact been really, you know, unobtainable because international rights are what they are. It could be quite tricky actually to buy the international editions of books. So I do feel like, um, you know, 
whatever deity you choose to believe in was um, shining on me the day that I went down there and was able to acquire a whole bunch of them. But also I've had some very generous authors and illustrators give me um, oh copies as well, wow, um, particularly if I'm yeah. working with their translator. Mm -hmm. so. Can I just ask, in, in Brisbane, mm. are schools and the Brisbane City Council libraries equipped with multi-language books? Some. 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 I think some libraries are. Mm -hmm. yeah, it depends on what, 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 what the, uh, yeah. the what groups that live in those yeah. areas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
experiences probably but my childhood was, was very different like all those translations were culturalized yeah mm. yeah yeah it can just be about the rhythm of the language too I mean even just in mm. this one again the character's name is B in the French it's Bea because it would have been short for Beatrice mm. and that um, you know will impact the actual rhythm of the sentences you know so sometimes it's even just those kinds yeah. of decisions it's part of the poetry Beautiful. whether or not you change the name right. so. um, you mentioned rhyme doesn't always translate across languages mm. have you come across any other themes or topics that may not be as easy to translate um, yes I think constantly um, yes uh, um, every translator would engage with that process of figuring out what um, works in for their market um, certainly in illustration I mean a lot of these are probably quite um, culturally transferable you know there's really beautiful um, uh, pictures like this one but I mean obviously there are going to be places where a piano is not meaningful um, as an instrument um, those sorts of things so yes absolutely every book I think needs to be looked at um, for the beauty of mm. what it offers um, you know what it says about its home culture and a bit like changing the names a decision then made about whether you're going to drop that into the new culture so they learn something about it or whether you're going to change those elements so that it assimilates more into another culture. Um, I mean, I think you could talk about universal themes, you know, love and death and family and whatever probably move around most places, um, but almost everything else, right down to clothing and food, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, probably that's why space. those kind of books are really best-selling, like the ones that are trying to teach how to get along with the grief yes, and things absolutely. like that and mm. to children and things. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> Do we have anything more from the... Thank you very much. I've said Lord. enough. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. It's so lovely. So, um, from my own childhood and the experience I had with the picture books, I uh, remember I used them as a tool to get away from the places I didn't like and people I didn't enjoy. Later on, I used the same books because they told me and they taught me how to keep silent and just try to read and watch what other kids and what other people are going through. So um, I would like you, I would like to invite you to listen to the story of Sally, a um, refugee boy, and to watch his experience. So. Um, I don't know if you can see this good enough, but we have left entire words behind, fleeing with our memories. I remember ice creams at the park, my favorite teacher, warm milk at bedtime. I wish I could forget deafening blasts, white doors shrouding the sun the sound of crying in the darkness. I try to remember the happy times, but the bad times force their way in. And if you didn't get the chance to look at the book itself, which was on the table, please do, because there are so many details that you can see, and probably they are not very visible from here. But yeah, you can see the rocket, you can see a mom trying to, whatever. So um, at this point, I would like to ask Inda Zari to please join me in the panel. And give it up. <laughs> Inda Ahmad Zari writes and illustrates stories that celebrate culture and nature and are often imbued with her fervent wish for a kinder world. Originally from Malaysia, she now splits her time between her garden home in Brisbane, Australia, and a sandy spot in the Middle East. She counts books, languages, Malaysian rice dishes, and the ocean as some of her greatest loves, apart from her family, of course, even though they often call her name very loudly just as she is about to write or sketch something important. This sounds very familiar to me. <laughs> 
Inda's first book, Sally, was a notable book in the 2022 CBCA Picture Book of the Year Awards. In 2021, she won this ASA CA Mentorship Award to develop a middle grade novel. Inda also works as a surgical doctor, <laughs> uh, swapping her paintbrush and writing cap for scrub hat and a scalpel when duty calls. Inda. Yes. <laughs> just <laughs> let me know what are you doing here and you're not back in your surgery room. <laughs> it's nicer here. Yeah. Warmer, probably. Warm, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would like just to start because I was so lucky to get one and only copy of your latest book, Twice the Law. Which I would let you just I haven't I haven't gotten my copy yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> I just went there to find that one. So um, I would like you to have a look and you see how different they are. And there is another book of Inda over there on the table. My question is, yeah. like, how can you include this much diversity in, um, in the setting and characterization and everything when you are illustrating for children from this very dark Mm. Melancholic kind of book. <laughs> well, I'm not responsible for the illustrations of these ones. So oh, okay. this is um, Sally was drawn by Anne, and she mm -hmm. has a very she has a style that I would not have been able to do. And she carried the story of Sally, which I wrote. She carried the words and the emotions so well. Um, and obviously, it's a like completely different um, that mood explains. with <laughs> yeah, with twice yeah. the love, yeah. which is uh, illustrated by an Indonesian. Um, uh, artist who used to live in Germany. Her name is Nabila, and mm -hmm. she has a completely different style. But um, I am beginning to illustrate my own books now, mm -hmm. um, and you're absolutely right. Some illustrators have a style that you can spot across the room, mm -hmm. and you know this is that person. Um, and I'm I still find like um, I'm still trying to find it. Uh, I may never find it, and I might just be. I might just have to be okay with not having an Inda style and just kind mm -hmm. of illustrating different kinds of pictures for different kinds of stories because I also write different kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 and I feel that I like to write different kinds of stories because I love to read different kinds of stories. I don't always go for one particular book only. Our soul needs different flavors and different varieties at, at different times in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm a, a jumble. Oh, amazing, <laughs> and that's perfect. So, uh, would you like to tell us more about, uh, like, Sally itself? You, did you have any, like, personal experience with yeah. people who had this? Yeah, um, so I, um, I, I am a medical doctor. I went to medical school in the UK. Um, and one of the things I was able to do as a medical student was join an organization called STAR, which is Student Action for Refugees. Um, and we went to conferences to try and find out more about what's happening in the world, why are there refugees, what are they going through, how can we help. Um, and in our little um, circle in Bristol University, we also buddied up with um, some, some refugees who had come across to England. Um, my buddy it was actually an Iranian lady named Zainat, and she had a, a, a son called Puria. And she is a doctor herself, but because of the language barrier, she was having a lot of trouble trying to get work now in England. And we used to meet up and chat about things. And um, you just, and really, I think in this, this day and age, um, you can't get away from listening about refugees because it's such a huge humanitarian crisis and it hasn't gotten any better. Um, and uh, you, it, there's wars all over the place, people displaced. And it sounds like something that's happening on the other side of the world, but it really isn't that far removed for us to kind of step into the shoes of someone who's lost their homes. We all have homes, we all have things that we love, we all, see, all have people that we love. And just spending five minutes to try and imagine what it might, might be like to lose that and to, have, to uproot um, against your will, um, and then to arrive at a shore where you're not actually treated that nicely for what or for all that horrible stuff that you've had to go through. Um, and that's where the story of Sally came out. I wrote it around sort of 2017, 2018. Um, I was a new mum at the time. And before, when I thought about refugees having to make 
these incredible journeys, I used to think, how hard was it to kind of have to do that, to, you know, uproot, um, journey in fear, not knowing what was going to happen. And then I had a child and I thought, oh, how hard would it be as a parent to have to carry your children? And then I thought, how hard would it be for that child to kind of have to go through that when really they should just be playing and having a normal childhood? Um, and in trying to understand what it would be like for a child and what would it what would it take for that child to survive that journey and find happiness at the end is why I wrote Sally. Yeah. 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 Sure. No. Thank. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, and since we're in a beautiful multilingual bookshop, and I wanted to talk about um, trying to be multilingual. Um, and, and where I'm at with that. And thank you so much, Tina, yeah. for inviting me. Um, I'd also like to say Selamat Pagi, which is good morning in my language, and also Assalamualaikum, which means peace be upon all of you. So my name's Inda, and I know quite a few of you already. Um, if you don't know me, I am an author, an illustrator, I'm a doctor. Um, and for as long as I can remember, I've been in love with books and languages and words. And I grew up in Malaysia. And I'm very fortunate to have learned um, a language other than my own, um, or as a matter of fact, a couple of languages from a very early age. So we learn Arabic so that we can recite the Quran and, and use it in our prayers. But my, my parents, my mom's here now, um, my parents also spoke to me in English. Um, and I really fell in love with English. You know, to this day is a language that I prefer to read in, is the one that I naturally, uh, most naturally write in. Um, and being, in, being fluent in English is actually a huge privilege. It really truly is, especially where I come from. And I'll never take it for granted. You know, being, being English is one of the most widely spoken, most dominant languages in the whole world. And speaking it well has certainly put me in a good stead. And it's opened up a whole world of books. And um, I was very lucky to have grown up in a household full of books and I know you know the feeling because I feel like I'm with my pupils here. Um, and I read so much that my mom um, would lock up all my storybooks a few months before I had an exam at school so that I'd concentrate on studying <laughs> and, and not be in some other fantasy world because of course school was a big deal and I wanted to do well at school as well. And in high school in Malaysia, they sort of try and prepare you for this one thing that you're going to do for the rest of your life and it divides you into the science stream or the art stream. And I didn't know really that I wanted to be a doctor, but I did the science stream anyway. Um, and, and I loved it. It was really good. Um, but there were big exams, huge exams at the end of high school. And my mom was preparing to get all my storybooks and lock them away, which is a terrible idea because um, she was going to lock it away for months. You know, the stakes are high. And I thought, how was I going to survive without losing my mind? And so finally I devised a plan and I spoke to some friends and we found a tutor and I filled out some forms and I applied for an extra exam subject, which was called literature in English. And there was so much reading. It was awesome. <laughs> so there was, we had to do poetry, we had to do a novel, we had to do a play, we had to do short stories. And so whenever my mom saw me reading these books, I assured her that all I was trying to do was understand imagery, alliteration, and juxtaposition. <laughs> and although it didn't look like it, I was actually studying really, really hard so that I can get an A. And I did. And um, that got me to college and to medical school in England, where I sure was glad that I spoke English well. But I was also thrilled that, you know, as I had come across from Malaysia, there were so many other people who had come across from different parts of the world. They all brought their own languages along with them. And because I've always loved the idea of being multilingual, I started to ask them to teach me a little bit of their languages. Mm -hmm. um, so they taught me simple phrases. And then along the way, I was starting to meet people from so many parts of the world that I wanted to do a little personal experiment and um, standardize my learning a little bit. And I chose three phrases that I would ask everybody. So the first one is, I'm hungry, because it would l earn at least a smile or at best a meal. And also it would, you know, if I'm tr in trouble somewhere in some foreign country, at least I can say that. So, man grosne hastam. In Farsi. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, see, it earned a smile. Um, J'ai faim in French. Au faim, mais tengo hambre. Mujibouk la qui est, which is Urdu. 
Um, and I, and I, I loved learning this, and I got fed as well quite, <laughs> quite, quite a number of times. Um, and then I had to say thank you, because I've just been fed. So there's merci, or merci, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And then I thought I'd, I'd um, find a word that was kind of not really usual, not something you'd say every day, but still, you know, sort of useful. And I picked the word rainbow. And the reason be it was because in Malay, the word for rainbow is pelangi, and in Indonesian, which is almost identical to Malay, the word for it is biang lala. So pelangi, biang lala, in two almost identical languages, they were so different, and that really intrigued me. So I started mm. asking people mm. how to say rainbow in their language, and I think in Farsi it's rangin kamen. That is yeah, <laughs> beautiful. Um, and in Urdu it is kouskouza, which is similar to mm -hmm. Arabic, which is kusul tamari. Mm -hmm. um, in French, Arconciel, which I love, and Arco Baleno in Italian, um, Arco Iris in Spanish and Portuguese, and so different from rainbow. Mm -hmm. But then I met a German guy who said it's Regenbogen. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know that. We've got the German yeah. community. <laughs> <laughs> and like getting closer, you know? Yeah. So I love. I love the way it's as if you could track the trajectory of these words as it jumps from country to country and morphs just a little bit and then, you know, pass it along. I, it just thrilled me. Um, I'm a nerd like Lara. <laughs> so it's like compare and contrast. And of course, I didn't just stop at three phrases. You know, once you start looking, you'll stumble upon so many connections and similarities. And um, I kept on asking my friends, how do you say blah, 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 blah in your language? And this became as formative uh, a part of, a, of my medical education as the medicine itself because I wasn't, which, which by the way, consisted on a thousand terms in Greek or Latin. Um, and I wasn't, because I wasn't only going to work with English doctors or English patients. Um, and it gave me great pleasure over the years to be able to greet my patients with their version of good morning uh, whenever I saw them on ward rounds. And I would hope that it gave them a little comfort, if not a little bit of amusement. And um, when I first moved to Australia as a doctor, I worked in New South Wales, and we had um, uh, an Italian ward janitor named Antonio, and I used to be able to chat with him with what little Italian that I spoke, and he'd tell me about his favorite movies and, and count me as his friend, and I was very honored by that. And I remember, as a medical student once, um, I had to accompany the midwives um, to, this, to the labor of this Lithu Lithuanian woman, and her labor was so hard and so long that I finished my shift before she was able to give birth. And and wanting to thank her, I said to her, "Achio," and she smiled. And if you can make a woman in labor smile, that's pretty <laughs> magical. <laughs> <laughs> and about twelve years ago, um, I met another doctor, who surprised me with his own love of languages. And he was born in London to a Croatian mother and a Portuguese father. Um, and knew a handful of other languages too. Um, his name is Sasha, and he's now my husband. <laughs> and as we got to know each other, he'd ask, how do you say, you know, we'd ask each other, how do you say blah, 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 blah in your language? Um, and I'm not sure if you know, but Malaysia was colonized by a lot of different people before the British, and then we got independent from the British. Um, Portugal was one of them, because they were trying to find a spice route in the east, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, so they landed there. Um, so when I told him the Malay word for cheese is keju, he go, oh, keju. <laughs> and I said, and the kameja is, is t-shirt, he goes, oh, kamizu. <laughs> and bandera is flag, and he goes, yeah, bandera. <laughs> and jendela is window, he goes, oh, janela. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sapatu, sapatu, uh, almari for wardrobe was amario for him. And even kampung, which is quintessentially the most Malay thing in the world. So my book, Night Lights, is set in a kampung, which is a village, a Malay village. He'd say, oh, kampung. And I, I went on and on just stealing what my title. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my head hurt. And I said, adoi, which is ow, which is what we say when, you know, we bump into something. And he goes, madoi. <laughs> no, I need help. <laughs> But it goes so many ways, you know, like Portuguese words are borrowed from Arabic, which is then loaned across mm. to different, mm. you know, languages as well. So maybe instead of saying, how do you say this in your language, I should have said, how do we say this in our language? Mm. Um, and there's just so much similarities that we 
haven't realized, maybe unless we went out looking for it. So Sasha and I still speak pidgin, Spanish, Malay, a bit of Portuguese and things like that um, to each other to this day. And let me make it clear, I'm far from fluent in any of these languages, and um, aside from Malay and English. Um, and there were times when I'd feel bad about it, about knowing only a smattering of different languages or passable at best, um, be, and never really being like a true polyglot, which is what I want it to be. And because like they say, a jack of all trades is a master of none. But who has time to learn all these different languages? But when I feel bad, I think back to that personal experiment that I did when I only decided to learn three, lang three things from a million different languages. And the most rewarding thing, aside from knowledge itself, was the reaction that I got from people whose words I, I presented back to them. And it was like when you sit down for a chat and someone remembered exactly how you like your cup of coffee, and they've done exactly that way. Or you walk into like a resort hotel on your holiday and someone's put a sprig of your favorite flower on your pillow. Or it's like they, f they feel, and it's only very little, but for that moment, they feel that you've taken the time to learn something about them that you, have, that you did not know before, and then you're using it back so that you can connect with them. And I think it is a beautiful thing. So circling back to the jack of all trades, that was only half the quote. And the whole quote goes like this. A jack of all trades is a master of none, but will always be better than a master of one. And circling back again to who has the time to learn all these languages, Children, they've got years ahead of them to learn all these different languages. And this is why picture books are amazing. And bookstores like this, where there's like a buffet of picture books in different languages, is absolutely, absolutely amazing. So is it okay if I share some of my... That's not why. Yeah, I'd love to hear too. Um, we're in the midst of packing up to move, and I really wanted to... Um, show you a wordless picture book. I wanted to start with the wordless ones um, called Bird by Beatrice Martin Vidal, but I couldn't find it, so I think it's packed up in a box somewhere. But I do have something from the library by Dan Daniel Miares, and it's called Float. And it's really simple. It's about... Um, <laughs> you did a good a newspaper, some hands. He's got a a paper boat, it starts to rain, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't have any words. It could be in any language. It could be, they could be written here and it zoomed across the puddle and the reflection of what, but you don't need to because it's, it, the story is already, it's already told. And it's a complete story with a beginning, a middle, and end. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so that, I began with that because I wanted to put forth that, you know, illustrations, especially illustrations this beautiful, um, are not going to, they're not going to, or rather you don't need to actually know a language perfectly in order to know the story or to enjoy a story. Um, because, you know, when we first met, you mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. said to me how sometimes you see it's the parents that are pulling yes. the children away from the shelves of the language that they did not speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the children the were in there because they've seen a pretty picture of they've seen the beginnings of the story and they mm -hmm. go for it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is um, a book that I bought here. I love that. El Silvido <laughs> de Juan. Um, and, you know, I, I know a bit of Spanish, but I didn't know the word El Silvido. But I reckon you could, you could kind of guess what it means in the first few pages. So, el silbido de Juan, that's a silbido, Juan silbaba, and there's more silbidos here, and other types of creatures that can also silbar. And in that lonely house, there's a silbido there as well. And all of a sudden, in four pages, without even reading this heavy text, you know that silbido means whistle. Mm -hmm. Imagine walking around and seeing, you know, in Spain and seeing a little kid whistling and you could actually say that to him. You know, it, it's, um, it, it's great. You've literally just learned one thing. And I haven't finished reading this because I haven't finished translating, going through and translating all of this uh, for myself. 
And so you could ask, why go through the whole process of trying to translate it when a translation probably exists in English and you could enjoy it that way? Which is true, because we, we can enjoy so many, so many things in English these days because of translations. Um, Pablo Neruda, for example, is a Spanish-speaking um, a, a Spanish author and poet um, whose, whose um, poetry I love, and it's been translated in English. Um, and one of his beautiful poems was, Tonight I can write the saddest lines. Do you guys know this one? It goes, Tonight I can write the saddest lines. Write, for example, that the night is shattered and the blue stars shiver in the distance. The night wind revolves in the sky and sings. And you can enjoy that as it is, because it is truly magnificent. But in, in Spanish, he actually wrote, Puedo escribir los versos más tristes esta noche. Escribir, por ejemplo, la noche está estrellada y tiritan azules los astros a lo lejos. El viento de la noche gira en el cielo y canta. And I feel like maybe there was an, an edge of sadness in tristes that we might not have enjoyed had we only stuck with the original version. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go whole ham and go straight for a book that is completely in, um, in a different language. There are amazing bilingual books like this one, which um, is a Korean classic, Waiting for Mama. And it has the Korean version, but also the English version. And the illustrations are stunning. Look at that. Look at that tram, that car kind of disappearing into the distance. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And those, those gestures as well, that little kid hanging off the, the tram station pole is incredible. And it reminds me of when Parasite, which was a Korean movie, mm -hmm. won lots of awards. Um, and um, the director would go up with a little translator um, and answer questions. And he said once, if you could get a uh, if you could get over the one inch high subtitle at the bottom of movies, your world would be opened up to so much story mm -hmm. if you can just overcome that one kind of hurdle um, in trying to know a different language. Um, I've got a couple more here that I'll finish off with quickly. And this is an example of um, how things build up on each other. Amasari, Sandia is there. She's the author of Amasari. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love is that in here, it's written in English and written beautifully in English, but there are words like um, palu and even ama itself. Now we know that ama is the word for um, mother in, uh, well, in Hindi, but I guess in a lot of um, languages spoken in, in oh, India. Like Arabic. Um, and in oh. <laughs> Arabic, yeah. Um, the kata chest as well. In here, you hear, you learn a few more names like Nanu is grandmother and how the uncles and the aunties are called Kala or Kalu. Um, and I got this book out of the library, which is a sari for Ami. Um, but by the time I've read this, I've already recognized the words from Amasari and from mm -hmm. Katha Chess. And then I'm able to kind of move forward and learn other words as well. So I feel like even though a book might be wholly in English with just one or two different words, um, you build on that into the next story and the next story and the next story. And in my book, Night Lies, um, it is in English. And the only Malay words really that I've used are my words for Tokma and Tokba, which are the uh, grandmother and grandfather. Now, I want you to, on your next Malaysian holiday, um, when you find an elderly person, call them Tokma or Tokba. And just watch yourself transform into an, an honorary grandchild in your <laughs> eyes and be fed all of the Malaysian rice dishes. It, it, I feel like in all these little books, um, there are a few words that are just reaching out to you and all we need to do is just reach back, reach back in. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much. No I, I need to congratulate you. and. Many other people in this room that I know, they have stepped beyond their fears and the restrictions just because of language. They mm. try to learn or experience other languages. Yeah. This is, for me, much appreciated, not just because I, uh, I run a bookshop based on that, but because I love to see the courage mm. in people mm -hmm. when they are not limited 
by the things that society, culture, background, other things would like to limit us and bound us. So, yeah, yeah congratulations Thank to you. you for the love you have for Thank all you. these languages. I will ask just one question because we are very short of time. And um, that is, have you ever had the experience that you cannot express yourself mm. by any of these words, any of these languages, but you can do that with a picture? Like, oh. just look at it. And that's how I feel. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess so. Or um, it's usually the expression of... Mm. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is an expression on the face of a child because they're so expressive, you know, like it's and it's hard to really pick an English word or you might come close with a Malay word or something like that. Yeah. But just, you know, a really beautifully illustrated, um, not one of mine, just from a different illustrator, I, I, it, it just kind of encapsulates the moment of whatever emotion that child is, is feeling. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Oh, I think so. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and I, uh, because we are all in need of happy endings, <laughs> this is uh, Ender's next book, which we are really waiting to have and stock shortly in the bookshop twice, The Love, which is about... So it's, it's a new baby book celebrating the magic of twins, um, so that when you, when you are about to gift uh, a baby book to a parent who's expecting twins or to a young family that has twins in them. Um, we, we just realized there wasn't really that, that many around that featured twins specifically rather than one child. And so here it is. Um, I wrote it in the throes of morning sickness when I was pregnant with my own twins and this kind of, this refrain kept coming into my mind um, and finally wrote it out. Um, and it's beautifully and joyfully um, illustrated by Nabila Adani, who is Indonesian and used to live in Germany. Um, and it's got these two redhead boys, identical boys on the cover, and they're actually based on my own boys, Leo and Ren. Um, I don't know why they're redhead, nobody knows. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mystery and it's a bit of an insight joke. But it <laughs> but um, but she did a lot of Instagram research, I think, to come to this. Um, but it basically features four different and very diverse families as they discover that they're about to have twins and then go on to have twins themselves. And this is just it's just the celebration of all the cool and slightly noisy, slightly chaotic, but still lovely things that twin families get to do. Amazing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank if we you. Have Do we have anything from the audience that you would like to? Amazing. Thank you all for just helping us to create these moments. It was really memorable, joyful, and we would have it in mind forever and ever. And Chloe, would you please play another tune for us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have the ending kind of thing. Thank you. So if you would like to um, get the books over there, you're more than welcome. Just make sure that they are signed by the artists and authors we have now available. And um, if you would like to just move, which I'm really trying to do, <laughs> get something to eat and do whatever, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you.